Good morning, Emmanuel. This morning's reading is taken from the book of Romans, and I'll be reading from chapter 1, verses 1 to 17. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God, the gospel he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures regarding his son, who as to his earthly life was a descendant of David and who through the spirit of holiness was appointed the Son of God in power by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. Through him we received grace and apostleship to call all the gentle Gentiles to the obedience that comes from faith for his name's sake. And you also are among those Gentiles who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. To all in Rome who are loved by God and called to be his holy people, grace and peace to you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. First I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you because your faith is being reported all over the world. God, whom I serve in my spirit, in preaching the gospel of his Son, is my witness how constantly I remember you in my prayers at all times. And I pray that now, at last, by God's will, the way may be open for me to come to you. I long to see you, so that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to make you strong. That is, that you and I may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, that I planned many times to come to you, but I've been prevented from doing so until now, in order that I might have a harvest among you, just as I've, as I've had among the other Gentiles. I'm obligated both to Greeks and non-Greeks, both to the wise and the foolish. That is why I'm so eager to preach the gospel also to you who are in Rome, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith, from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Cheryl. Um, if you haven't gathered already, we are studying the book of Romans, and we'll be doing so for the next, well, at least six months, possibly longer, depending on how the Lord takes us along. Um, Romans is such an exciting book. If you don't know it, if you're not familiar with it, you're in for a treat, and uh, I think it's appropriate that we ask for God's help as we come to it together. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the chance we have now to open your word, to think about it, to hear what you would have uh, to say to us through your word. Give us ears that would hear what you want to say. Give us hearts that would accept it and make our lives more and more like the Lord Jesus Christ. And we ask this in his name. Amen. Uh, on the evening of the 31st of October, 1517, a young German named Martin was making his way towards the church cathedral in the German town of Wittenberg. And in his one hand, he had a big sheet of rolled up paper, and in his other hand, he had a hammer and some nails. And he was going there to, to put that sheet of paper on the church door, which was kind of like the, 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 church not or the, the community notice board in Martin's day. So he got up to the door, put the paper there, and secured it to the front door. He chosen his moment very strategically because the next day was All Saints Day, 1st of November. And All Saints Day was a big religious holiday, remembering all the so-called saints who had died before. But it was also the day when the church offered anyone who would pay enough money seriously attractive spiritual brownie points. The way it worked, these things were called indulgences, and the way it worked is basically you pay a fee to the church, and in, re in return you get some of your sins forgiven. You get pardon with God. Pay as you go forgiveness. Uh, and All Saints Day was particularly special because on that day, the church had a huge pot of indulgences, what they called the merits of the saints. And basically, you get all the good deeds done by past saints, all the ones they didn't need to use, and you get to buy them 
right? So somebody else has to do all the heavy lifting, you get to benefit. Really sounds fantastic, doesn't it? Well, Martin Luther had realized that that's not what the Bible says about salvation or forgiveness or the gospel or God or anything. He just recently discovered that that's not the way it works with God. And so for the first time, as he read his Bible, he realized that salvation, forgiveness, is a free gift. You can't buy it. You can't earn it. And so what he did was put this poster against the church door, which had 95 points that he thought was, were important to discuss about indulgences. Now, the effect the next day when the crowds gathered at the cathedral was massive. Uh, word spread like wildfire. People were talking about what he had put up there, wondering what it is that the Bible actually says about these things. And, of course, it kick-started what we know as the Reformation. Now, what book was it that Martin Luther was reading when he had this light bulb moment and ultimately led to the change of the world? He was reading the book of Romans. I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that Romans is probably the most influential book that's ever been written. It's impacted more people, more lives, more cultures than perhaps any other book that has ever been written. So we get to study it for the next six months. And one of the big ideas about the book of Romans is captured right here in the opening passage that we had read to us. Uh, sometimes it's hard to work out what the big idea of a passage is. In this case, it's not hard at all. Just have a look at some of the verses. Verse 1, Paul, he says, set apart for the gospel of God. Verse 2, Paul, uh, Paul says that this was a gospel promised beforehand. Verse 9, Paul says that his whole life is about preaching the gospel. Verse 15, he says he's eager to preach the gospel. Verse 16 says he's not ashamed of the gospel. Verse 17, he says it's the gospel that reveals God's righteousness. You can't miss it, can you? This whole passage and this whole book actually is all about God's gospel. Now, I guess everybody realizes that the gospel, whatever that is, is central to Christianity, but I think there's a lot of confusion as to what that gospel actually is about. If you ask 10 Christians, you might get 10 different answers about what the gospel means or what it is. So let's have a look together, very simply, three questions. What is it? What does it do? And why does it matter? Let's start with our first question. What is the gospel? Well, verse 1, Paul says this. He says, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God. Now, if you ever get a handwritten letter in the post... Does anyone still get those? For anyone who's Gen Z and younger, a letter, it's like a text message, but you wrote it with a pen on a piece of paper, and then you put it in what they call an envelope and delivered it. And then post was what a guy on a bicycle brought to your house and when he gave you the letter. All right? So anyway, if you got a handwritten letter, you'd have to go right to the bottom to realize who it was from at the end, right? From whoever. Uh, in the ancient world, you put who it was from right up front, sort of like a a WhatsApp message. You know who it's coming from right away. Um, so here you have Paul right at the start of his letter introducing himself. And he describes himself in a pretty remarkable way. He says on one hand, he is a slave of Christ Jesus. A slave. Now, that's the lowest of the low in society. Who is he a slave to? His whole life, he says, belongs not to him, but to King Jesus. Secondly, he says he's an apostle. What's an apostle? Well, the word apostle simply means something like an ambassador, somebody that's been sent with authority to speak on somebody else's behalf. So you couldn't get two more contrasting ideas to describe yourself, a slave at the bottom of the food chain, an ambassador at the top of the food chain. Both of them, though, have to do with someone who's been captivated by this gospel that he's speaking about, one that he's given his life to as a slave, the other that he's speaking on behalf of as an ambassador. Okay, but that doesn't actually explain what the word means. What does gospel actually mean? If you had a first century dictionary, you could find the word gospel in that dictionary. It wasn't a particularly religious word. It was a word that was used in the common culture. A gospel in the ancient world was some big, newsworthy, history-changing announcement. So a new heir is born, and, uh, and the empire issues this, this gospel, this announcement to everybody that there is a new, there's a new heir to the throne. Or perhaps you won a, a battle against your enemy and a, a big victory. Uh, or perhaps you lost a battle. Either way, you need to let people know. And so you put this big headline news out there called a gospel. Massive history-changing announcement. That's a gospel. Now, in that last example, hopefully you can see a gospel isn't necessarily good news. I know we talk about the good news. It means big news. But the good news depends on whose side you're on. If you're on the losing side, it's just big news. It's not good news. 
And as we'll see, that's true for Christianity as well. But notice as well, Paul says here that this is God's gospel, the gospel of God. Now, straight away, that tells us something about this message, this good news, this announcement. It's not ours. We don't have the right to change it, to alter it, to water it down, to make it more acceptable. There's no revised edition that ever comes out of the gospel. It is the same announcement that God makes now and forever. So, what is this announcement? What is it that God wants to say to the world? Well, did you, have, did you see it in verse 3? Here it is. The gospel he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures regarding his Son, who as to his earthly life was a descendant of David, and who through the Spirit of holiness was appointed the Son of God in power by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. Now that's a mouthful. It's a long sentence. Let's notice a few things. First of all, the announcement that God is making doesn't come out of the blue. It's not as if 2,000 years ago, suddenly there was this new idea on the scene that God had sent his son. No, Paul says here, it was promised beforehand, verse 2, in the Holy Scriptures. It concerns things that were promised centuries earlier in the Old Testament Scriptures. Are any of you still doing the Bible reading plan for the year? I don't want to shame anybody, but anyone, anyone keeping it up? Wonderful, we've got a few hands, that's brilliant. If you read through the Bible, and you should do that, what you'll soon discover if you're reading carefully is that uh, this is not 66 disjointed, unrelated books that people have just thrown together. Yes, it's written over 1,500 years by maybe 35, 40 different people, but the incredible, miraculous thing is it tells one story. It tells one story. It has one plan of action that God is unveiling and unrolling down through history. And it is all about, Paul says here, the gospel. Do you remember the first time you discovered that, that there is one big story that the Bible is telling? Maybe you haven't discovered that. It's an incredible thing to realize that God is telling one story and that it all holds together. Secondly, notice that this gospel has a very specific focus to it. And that focus is on a very specific person. It's captured in those first three words of verse 3. He says it's the gospel regarding his son. The gospel is all about Jesus, about God's son. He is the focus. He is the subject. The gospel actually isn't about us at all. The gospel has implications for us, but it's about Jesus. It's about him. It's about what God is saying about him. So what is God saying about him? What is this announcement that changes everything? Well, two things. Did you see them? Number one, this son of God is a descendant of David. And we say, well, why make a big deal about somebody's family line? But again, if you're reading your Old Testament, you know why. Because the one that God promised who would turn the world right again, who would fix what is broken, who would forgive and restore and rule the world with justice, was going to come from the family of David. The king of God's eternal kingdom had to be a descendant of David. Paul is saying, do you know that Jesus has those credentials? Now we might say, well, there were many descendants of David. How do we know that he is the one? Well, verse 4. And, he says, who through the spirit of holiness was appointed the Son of God in power by his resurrection from the dead. How do we know that this is the one? What makes this descendant of David so special? Because Paul says, in the power of God's own spirit, this person who was killed on a cross was raised victoriously to life again by God. And in that incredible moment, that victorious moment, God declared Jesus to be the king of the universe and the rightful son of God, the one that we must now recognize as the son of God. Uh, Jesus Christ, he says, our Lord, verse 4. Jesus Christ, our Lord. You know, some people say to me uh, that often Christians struggle to share the gospel with their friends and family, and, and that's, that's a good struggle to have because we want to we wanna be keen to share the gospel. And people say, well, I don't know what to say. I don't feel qualified uh, to share the gospel. I don't even know where to start. That sentence, Jesus Christ, our Lord, those four words are a great summary. That is the gospel in a nutshell. You can't get a simpler easier to remember, and more succinct summary of what the Christian hope is than those four words. Jesus, the man who was, who was born in Bethlehem, who walked the earth 2,000 years ago or so, who had Mary and Joseph as parents, worked in a wood shop. That Jesus is Christ, or Messiah, same word. King of God's kingdom, the one eternal king that God promised he would send. And not only that, but he is actually Lord. 
Lord. That title was only ever used of God himself in the Old Testament. And here you have Jesus being called Lord, because that is who he is. So God's announcement to the world is that a king has arrived who rules the world, who is also God in flesh. Now notice, it's a statement of fact. It's not even at this stage asking for a response. Right? The gospel isn't primarily about what I do with it. It's not inviting Jesus into my heart, so much as it is hearing what God is saying, that God's king is on the throne, and we better bow the knee to him. See, what we do with that is up to you. It's either good news or bad news, depending on what you would do with that news. And so our plan as a church, as we think about vision, as we plan, as we scheme and dream, is to make sure that that announcement is at the center of all that we do. That you walk into any Sunday service or you go to any kids program or any growth group and at some point you're going to hear that Jesus Christ is Lord and what that means for your life. Right? It's not just a thing that saves you, it's also a thing that transforms you as we'll see in just a moment. Secondly, let's look at what the gospel then does. What does this announcement do in the lives of those who truly believe it and, and uh, live by it? Well, firstly, it does a few things. Firstly, it radically changes your life. And that's not an overstatement. It radically changes your life. Paul uh, describes the sort of change that happens in verse 5. Paul says, Through him, that's through Jesus, we received grace and apostleship to call all the Gentiles to, and here it is, the obedience that comes from faith for his name's sake. What change does the gospel bring in your life when you understand it and believe it? Well, first of all, you, you trust it. Right? You realize it's true. There is faith that happens. Faith is simply entrusting yourself to something that you now believe to be true. When you understand that God has put his son in charge of the universe and therefore in charge of your life, you can't ignore that. Well, you can ignore it, but there are consequences to that. If it's true, surely you have to believe it. And when you believe it, something else happens. There is obedience, he says, that comes from faith. In other words, if Jesus really is King and Lord, then you better live in obedience to him. You better do what he says you should do. You, should, you better live the way he says you should live. There's no other option, is there? And of course, because he's a loving king and a good king, what he tells us to do and the way he calls us to live is what is best for us. It is where the most joy is found. And so our lives are transformed as we really believe that this announcement is true. Jesus Christ is Lord. And Paul, of course, is Exhibit A. I mean, Paul, just a short while earlier, was the number one most violent and vocal opponent of Christianity who made it his mission to destroy the Christian faith. And now here he is, the most enthusiastic and passionate ambassador and champion for Christianity. What, what do you, how do you explain that? The answer is he heard the announcement and he believed it. And he was changed. Or think about who he's writing to. Uh, these Christians in Rome would have consisted of many, many uh, former pagan worshippers who would have lived their whole lives under the firm conviction that there are many gods who have to be kept happy with an endless cycle of rituals and, and rites. You know, there were gods of weather and fertility and farming and business. You name it, there were gods for everything. You had to keep them all happy. It was relentless. It was exhausting. And yet here they are, so radically changed that they are worshipping alongside Jews to a Jewish Messiah. How do you explain that? So, so radical is their change, Paul says in verse 8, that news about it is spread everywhere. Verse 8, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you because your faith is being reported all over the world. What happened? Well, they were changed by the gospel. The second thing it does is it unites people in the most incredible way. Verse 7, Paul is writing to these Christians in Rome, he says this, to all in Rome who are loved by God and called to be his holy people. In other words, he's writing to one united group of people who are now together children of God. Now let's remember, this church is made up, yes, of a lot of former pagan Gentiles, but also a big number of Jewish converts. Jews and Gentiles, if you know anything about any history of Jews and Gentiles, you know that they don't get along ever. Right? They don't see eye to eye. They don't like each other. How is it that you have Jews and Gentiles side by side worshipping together? Now, it wasn't all 
perfect. We'll see as the letter goes on that there were a few uh, you know, tremors and, and, and ructions within the church that Paul needs to address. That's part of why he's writing. But there's something there that has bound them together in the most supernatural way. There is no human institution that has ever ex- succeeded at joining people together who are so different. Right? You don't get that. You get it in the church. You get it in the gospel. It's an incredible thing. And we want this church to be a people that is, really a, that is a melting pot of different kinds of people. Different cultures, different walks of life, different backgrounds, different social strata, different nations all together in Jesus. And when that happens, when the gospel grips your heart and unites you like that to others, then everything else that is part of our personal preference or part of our culture becomes secondary, right? It becomes negotiable. Oh, we're singing Afrikaans songs. I'm not Afrikaans. That's fine. We're together in this. Oh, that person's wearing that, or that person, they're playing that kind of music again, or you know, that particular worship style is not what resonates with me. Who cares? We're together in the gospel. And so everything else becomes negotiable except the fact that Jesus Christ is Lord. What a great thing that is. The third thing the gospel does, we see in this passage, is it sends people. It actually transforms them, transforms them in such a way that it sends them out with news of this message. Because once you've realized that Jesus Christ is Lord, you can't keep it to yourself. How could you? So he, Paul is talking here in this opening section about his desire to take this gospel message to Rome. Now, he's never met these Christians. He's never interacted with them. But his great desire is to go there with the gospel message. Look at verse, 30, uh, verse 9. Paul says, God, whom I serve in my spirit in preaching the gospel of his son, is my witness how constantly I remember you in my prayers at all times. And I pray, here it is, I pray now at last by God's will the way may be opened for me to come to you. Or verse 13, he says, I don't want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, that I plan many times to come to you, but have been prevented from doing so until now, in order that I might have a harvest among you, just as I've had among the other Gentiles. Paul can't help himself. He has been so transformed by the gospel that he he is so eager to get to Rome and bring the gospel to these Christians and to their non-Christian counterparts in the city who haven't yet bowed the knee to Jesus. You see, the gospel comes to Christian and non-Christian. It's not something you hear at at the beginning of your faith and then move on from. It completely transforms you for the rest of your life to figure out what it means that Jesus Christ is Lord. And so Paul is eager to get to there, to preach the gospel, he says. Now, to go to Rome would have cost Paul a great deal in time, money, effort, would have been great, incredibly dangerous, but he's not worried about that. And, and one of the reasons he's, he's so keen is because he has an even bigger plan and dream. And we only pick this up later in the letter, but it might be worth just highlighting it now. That is, he wants to go to Rome, meet these Roman Christians, so that he might be able to take the gospel even beyond them to the ends of the known world. And the ends of the known world in Paul's day was Spain. So just listen to these words from chapter 15. Here's why Paul is connecting with these Christians in Rome. But now there is no more space, no more place for me to work in these regions. And since I've been longing for many years to visit you, I plan to do so when I go to Spain. And I hope to see you while passing through and that you will assist me on my journey there after I've enjoyed your company for a while. See, he wants these Christians not just to be concerned about their city, but to be concerned also for the ends of the earth, Spain. You know, one of the things the gospel does for us is it gives us a world vision. It gives us a heart for those in far off places that we may never have met that they would hear about Jesus Christ as Lord. It's one of the reasons we're so keen to support our ministry uh, overseas, particularly in Thailand. We have four families now doing gospel ministry in Thailand. Later in the year, we're sending a small team. We've been invited to, to go along and serve uh, to help refresh that team. And I'll be speaking at the SIM conference. Why do we do these things? It's costly, it's expensive, because Jesus Christ is Lord. And we believe the ends of the earth matter. But of course, Jesus isn't just sending us to the ends of the earth. He's sending you to your neighbor, to your neighborhood. He's sending you to the girl you study with at college, the old lady in the retirement home that you see all the time, the the family that you're getting to know as you wait for your kids at school, the person in the office that you haven't spoken to. God is sending us out with the good news that Jesus Christ is Lord. Well, lastly, let's look very briefly then at a third question. Why is it that the gospel matters? We know it changes people. We know it radically transforms them. It it changes, it unites, it sends. Why does it do that? How does it do that? 
And the answer is the deepest answer for that question, why the gospel matters, is because the gospel saves. That's the ultimate work that it does in our lives. Look at how he ends the passage in verse 16. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. And, and he's implying there, I guess, that there are reasons that you might want to be ashamed. I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first for the Jew and then for the Gentile. Now, we're going to talk a lot in the months to come about what this means and how it all works, but at least I want you to realize at this early stage that the most incredible thing the gospel message does in our lives is it saves us. It saves people. It, it transforms them from being on this path to destruction and brings them in to God's eternal family. That's the power of God, he says. It unites, it sends, it changes, but first, only because it saves. So he says in verse 17, For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, from beginning to end, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. That last sentence, by the way, is the, the sentence that got Martin Luther. That's where he stopped and his eyes popped out of his head and he said, What? The righteous will live by faith? I don't have to earn it. I don't have to buy it. I can't achieve it. It comes by faith. No wonder he was so disturbed as he realized what the church was doing. The righteous will live by faith. There's, there's eternal life on the line here. And so Martin Luther's whole outlook changed. Friends, no wonder he talks about it as the power of God. There is nothing more powerful in our world today than when the gospel transforms people. You know, we can plan to do all kinds of things this year, Impressive things, spectacular things that make a name for ourselves in some way. But nothing will ever be as powerful as the work that God does when he transforms people and brings them into his kingdom. When he softens their heart to such a point that they can actually believe that this is true and live in the light of it. Has that happened in your life? We have to ask that question every week. Because there may be somebody sitting here who has not yet been transformed and you'll know if it's happened because there is a distinct difference in the before and after picture. Suddenly, your whole value system, your whole outlook, the things that you think are important are transformed and now center around King Jesus. If that hasn't happened to you, we would love to help you walk that road. And if it has happened, then make sure that every day you are living in light of the gospel, that Jesus is indeed Lord of every area of your life. I am not ashamed of the gospel, Paul says. It is the power of God for salvation. Let's pray together. Oh Lord, we, we hear today that you have a, an announcement to make. And it's an announcement that is really the only hope for ourselves, our world, our city, our culture, that Jesus really is King and Lord. Lord, give us such a conviction and a passion for Jesus and for his gospel that our lives would be completely upended and transformed. May all that we do and all that we are be lived for him so that he might be made known and that men, women, children, we be brought in from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of your Son. And we pray this in his name. Amen. Let's stand as we end our time together singing.